us. So. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Real Euro Football Talk. Um, it's another wonderful day in paradise, as always. Um, I believe it's today that we should be getting more news in terms of Germany about hopefully rules here and there lifting up. So, because at the end of the day, everybody knows this. I've been saying it almost every episode. I need a haircut. And this is really bothering me. Um, also, Coach Abash, I know you need a haircut as well. And this is why we're not uh, having a video so yeah. far. Yeah, this is the biggest thing right now where it's like, I've been wanting to also post more videos, but I'm technically not allowed to because, you know, we got to get two yeses and we're a team. And if there's only one, I'm not allowed to because I can't have Coach Sebastian wake up to a surprise video posted already. But anyhow, um, today's guest, uh, we have the head coach of the Danube Dragons from Vienna, and it is Coach uh, Stefan Pokorny. How's it going? Hey, Servus from Vienna, Wien. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I, I followed your podcast the last couple of weeks already, and I think it's a great thing. And because you hear so many different things from from Europe, and that's awesome. Appreciate. It. I, I didn't know you were following like closely. That's good. We got some viewers yeah. or listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how's everything going on your end? Because I mean, just talking about a little bit in the, in the pre-talk. Um, of course, you guys are basically in the same situation as everybody is. Like we are. You know, in Germany, I mean, France got canceled, of course, but even in the States, um, for example. So you guys have the lockdown, but I know you're also trying to stay busy, trying to keep your guys as a unit and then kind of see what happens. Yeah, so I think it's really similar to, to everywhere in, in, in Europe currently. So we're not allowed to practice and uh, we found out about Zoom and um, used this uh, really heavily. So we're going to have like... Uh, our chalk talks, we're going to have uh, um, weekly meetings with players. So there's an offensive and defensive meeting per week once. Um, and also like a coaches meeting every week. So we made that a, like a, we call it a short fix where we come together, talk about the news and uh, perspectives and what goals, what could happen and to get, keep everybody engaged. I think that's so important currently that you don't drift away Mm -hmm. with your mind from football mm -hmm. because there's so many things you can do in this time and, and use it and that does our goal to come back stronger after, after this mean, pandemic. We notice it with our guys too, it's more like, I mean, 100% I have a few guys listening but I give them a lot of busy work and Coach Sebastian knows I do <laughs> homework and, 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 and I send them tape on teams that, that we're supposed to play against and I say, hey, I want you to scout the opposing defense send me your homework and you have all these games. I make them do busy work, you know, and some of them will text me and say, oh, this is so boring. They're like, I already know what they're doing after one quarter. I'm like, I don't care. Maybe they show something different in the third quarter. Yeah. You gotta have time. Like you said, it's more about keeping that their, their head more attached to football because, I mean, you know, God willing, when everything happens, once we start up, that's going to be the hard part if your team's kind of like already drifted off and then to get them like, you know, from one day to the next, all right, here we're going. Um, was I going to talk about was, are you also doing like team building a little bit with, through the Zoom talks, like games here? Yeah, also? yeah, yeah. So, so our, our Zoom meetings are actually most of the times about team building. So it's um, our defensive coach, uh, Lucas Habersack. He does like uh, Kahoot uh, yeah. quizzes every week mm -hmm. where he quizzes the players about each other. And that, that was really fun. So do you know Kahoot? I, I, I think you guys talked about it on one of the chalk talks. And then I remember Googling and looking at it, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's really funny. So you, you got a question on the on the on your screen yeah. and the players can answer on the cell phone. And there's always a score who hits the uh, answer the fastest and if it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have a ranking at the end of the quiz and you see who, who won and Oh. Uh, are there are there prizes? Do you guys do prizes? Not yet, so Not yet. I think it's it's the players are so That's <laughs> hungry to win. Because we did a coach Sebastian did like a, also we talked about doing like a Jeopardy night. We did that as well, and it was just random yeah. questions. It was like of course from the history of the program, GFL stuff. Um, I Inter started <laughs> interesting questions from coach. I started Meta, getting like... crazy with the questions. It was more like 
who won the Swiss Bowl five years ago. <laughs> we have, you know, we have, I think, what, four, four Swiss players yeah, on four, our team? Five Swiss guys, yeah. So I was just trying to see, like, who knew. And then I was asking, actually, the, the groups on the team that actually have no Swiss guys. So, like, the other Swiss guys are watching. They're like, I know this. And the Germans are just like, why are you asking us these questions? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, you know, like you said, it's team building. It's to have fun at the end of the day. I mean, I could say personally as a coach, I mean, we're, we're to a point where it's kind of like, of course, there's football you can still do. Yeah. But, so. you know, like we can't be hands on. And at the end of the day, that's, that's like our biggest thing, you know, because yeah. just, you could do all X's and O's, be doing coaches clinic. Like I was doing that. Um, but then at some point you're kind of sitting there and you're like, I need to, we need some action, you know. Yeah, right now, absolutely. I mean, you know, right now we probably wouldn't be sleeping. We'd be game planning for games and you know how it is during the season. So it's completely on the other side. Yeah. I think for for us it was the hardest because we were away three days before our first game day, so we had already our game day, a game week prep started and had one practice in, and on Wednesday or Thursday they kind of told us, okay, we won't play this Sunday, okay. and that was really hard for us because everybody was on, on the peak, so mm -hmm. you worked there for seven months and yeah. now it's happening and uh, everybody's ready and. Suddenly they say, okay, it's, yeah. it's done. On this point, you already had your Americans in. What you did with them, you were able to send them home because America closed the border really soon. So or, uh, you, you get everyone out or how that works? Um, we actually had only one, one importer this year. Uh, it's Chad Jeffries and he's now still in Austria because oh, uh, he got his wife here. He got his kid here. So, I was married, okay. yeah, the dragon yeah. has good setups. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> no, but that's, yeah. I mean, that's that's good too because I mean, because right now, officially, you guys are like us. I know, like in Prague or sorry, Czech Republic, they're starting to work out. So, at least the guys I think just started training a week ago or something, like in general, they're allowed to yeah. go to gyms. Also, okay. the rules, yeah, right. So, like, apparently, I mean, that's good because then guys get to work out. I mean, I mean. Personally, I mean, 100%, I'm pretty sure you're, you're checking in with Chad here and there. Like, how is it for yeah. him? I mean, he does have his family, but also for him kind of being away from a group of guys. Because, like, I mean, for us, like, we basically have one of our imports still here, our running back, but he's on yeah. his own. Normally, the house would be filled with other imports. You know? Right. And that's what a lot of teams have right now. I think that's a really hard part if, if you're alone or somewhere sitting in your own room and not able to do anything. Don't able to be um, meeting other players, mm -hmm. so so this was really easy going for for Chad. So he has now really a lot of time to to see his uh, child and um, concentrate on his family. But I know there are many players still in Austria, so some teams still have team parts here, and I don't think that it's easy for them. Hundred percent, that's a tough one. I mean, a last one to the Corona topic. Um, how do you get the guys in shape? How was the rules in Austria? Do you still keep the guys in shape um, for workouts or something? I mean, in Germany, they were allowed to go alone outside and make in sports. How was the rule there in Austria? Um, it's the same. So, so gyms are closed at least until end of May in Austria. Yeah. So all sports facilities are closed. So you're not allowed to go on any grass field or turf or whatever um, sports facility so you're allowed to go outside to have like a walk or run um, and what we did we, we sent them some homework at the beginning but the feedback we got after two or three weeks is, is okay it's it's not the same and they try yeah. Yeah, of course. it's for three minutes. It's kind of gets boring, and um, yeah. it'll be interesting to see in which shape they are when when we come back. And I, think I hope we have I mean, <laughs> Every coaches are uh, 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 try to see uh, how in shape the guys are because in Germany there still is the talk to start the season. You know, we not officially cancel yeah. the season. So we also talk, tell our guys that you need to stay in shape no matter what because. We don't know what our federation is doing when they open up the, yeah. the practice fields. Maybe they'll say, "Hey, you can get, you can, you can play." And then yeah. uh, we probably have seven days to the first game. I, I, I <laughs> prepare for everything. 
we prepare for, for, for really everything down there. No, that's true, man. And anything can happen. You know, and everybody knows yeah. it's known how it is in Germany. And I mean, we don't got to get to it more, but with the Federation. But at the end of the day, the good thing is they want to play. But it could be from the next day over saying, hey, we're playing. And like you're trying to talk about, it's like more about trying to find a way to keep the guys in shape. I mean, do we really know? No. You know, yeah. so like the good thing is, is like you have to sort of, like if you do time trainings maybe twice a week or it's not really football per se, but at least let's say one or two where you could time the stuff. They, they could post their times with their videos. It's also at the end of the day still team building as competition, but at least you can kind of see if they're doing something or not because 100%, we all know this, there's guys yeah. that aren't doing anything, you know? Yeah. And then they're going to come back on the field and you're going to see it and you're going to be like, oh, my God, you know? <laughs> that, that's the biggest – That's I think that's one of the bigger bigger ones looking at because, like we talked about before, we have to look at their health. You know, we don't want them yeah. to get hurt, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talk about the program to Nuba and so forth. I mean, I want to get into it because I don't know how many people know. I mean, you've been there for actually a while. Basically, I believe your whole coaching and playing career, right? Yeah, that's right. When, so, when, when did you start playing? Yeah. I, I stopped playing in the year 2000. So that was my first year with the Dragons. Um, I actually got involved with football the first time or got in contact with football the first time in 98. Yeah. When my father got uh, tickets for the Austrian Bowl. Okay. So he, he worked at that time for IBM and it was called the IBM Austrian Bowl at that time. Mm -hmm. And got his tickets and watched the game. And two years later, a friend of mine looked up the teams in Vienna and found out about the mercenaries at that time. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Dragons were uh, renamed in 2002, I think. It was 2002. Yeah. Then until then it was the mercenaries and then we became the became the Dragons and yeah played there for 11 years and then started coaching. What, what, what did you play? What position? I played linebacker, played linebacker right. for most of my career yeah. Yeah and why the Dragons? Why not the Vikings? You know there is a the big <laughs> the big club in, in Vienna around I don't know uh, how that comes. Was just random was, or? It was really the log logistics so the, the Dragons were about 20 minutes from my home and the Vikings 45 minutes okay and, and that was really the reason because we passed their uh, practice field every day on our way to school yeah and so there, there's a subway running and we could look down to the practice field and so like okay let's go here and we, we were a really small club at that time okay. so when I started in this youth team uh, we still played eight-man football yeah and in my first game, we had nine people dressed. Oh, wow. Really? And, and we played the Vikings, and they brought like 45 players. <laughs> eight-man football, and they crushed just 70 nothing or something like that. That was about to was... say, no one fair. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And how, how was the development then of the, of the youth and men's program of the, of the Dragons over the years? Because now you are forever in the AFL or I don't remember a year without the Dragons in the AFL. Yeah. So I think it, uh, one of the biggest part played uh, Ivan Sivko. Yeah. Yeah. He was our former head coach. So he started in 2004, five as a, as a youth coach for the Dragons. Maybe it was 2002 already. And he really built up the, the youth program. And that was kind of, kind of the cornerstone where we started because he, he assembled a group of players which won every age class, they, they moved up. Yeah. And this group came up then until 2010, where we won our first, one and only championship with the Dragons. Yeah. And there we kind of established ourselves then in the AFL with that crew of players. Yeah. So then the Yorker team, I think there was one or two years where we played in the uh, second league, okay. but that was when I was really young, so I can't remember when that was the last time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember I played also a uh, coach against you when I was in France against uh, the new Dragons. So always uh, a solid team, tough to uh, tough to play. Like uh, in the States, you say blue colored football. Of course, you're the green white ones, but uh, <laughs> hard working, hard working guys, and it was, it was always always tough to to uh, play against you, and. Um, yeah, how, how it becomes then for you to be um, a coach 
you you are a player in 2010 when you win the the Austrian ball, or you already coaching there, or? Um, I, uh, uh, during my playing time, I, I started coaching the youth teams. Yeah. So, I also were able to coach the under 13, 15, 16, 19. Um, every group we had at that time, and in 2011, I stopped playing because of an injury, and I think then I have been a head coach for the under-19 team for one year, mm -hmm. and then Coach Sivko asked me uh, to be the defensive coordinator, so I was really young, uh, really unexperienced. Yeah. It was the best fit for, for that time because we had a, a different defensive coordinator every year, and he said like he wants to have continuity and uh, build up the system um, because that's what we are able to do. And it was not always easy to find any sponsors. So we were really happy this year. It was the first time that we have a name sponsor. Um, and as a beginning, so it's kind of the next, next phase for us because yeah. the last couple of years we were not able to bring any coaches um, and only had one import every year. But we said like we were still so so good with our um, domestic coaches that we can compete with other teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, that sounds, sounds great. And was there already a plan at some point? You want to be a head coach or was just like it, it happened? Uh, not really. So my plan was to be a coach. So that, that was really a plan. Um, and I always knew there, there's even Sivko, the, the head coach. and then suddenly he stepped down um, four years ago, and the board approached me and told me to first first they asked me to to find a new head coach. So I, they should recruit a new head coach. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to have some American guy come in because everybody has American head coaches, and mm -hmm. I did that for maybe one and a half months and reported them that I don't see anybody who would fit here for a, for a long time plan and right. that I would like to interview for that job. And yeah, yeah two weeks or later, they announced me as a new head coach. Yeah. What is and, great, what is an is a, is a, a Austrian way there to, to do? I mean, this is, uh, it's really, really good. I like that. Um, how, yeah. how was the transition for you? Because this is a thing I've noticed and just to say it off the bat, I think, I think you're a really good coach. You know what you do. And the big thing is, is, you're a student of the game. Like you go to a lot of clinics and so forth. I know you fly to the States, for example, this year you spoke at the, the coaches convention, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, does this come from someone? Does it also come from like the, the playing career aspect of it where you say, you know what, I want to get better to help out the players here? Because to be honest, I mean, we talk about when we have players that are hungry, right? They show that effort, yeah. but you, you have that where it's like, you want to get better and you're doing what yeah. you have to do. You also help teach because you have the chalk talks and so forth right now during this lockdown. I mean. Where does that kind of come from? Like, why is that? Hmm. Uh, a lot of coaches I don't think, do it. A lot of coaches don't do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, no. absolutely. But I think it comes from inside of me. So mm -hmm. it's not really something I need to turn on. So it, it's always turned on to be mm -hmm. hungry and um, to uh, um, learn more about football. And I cannot really explain it why I'm doing it, but it's right. the game I love. And mm -hmm. I think... There's so so many things you can um, do you don't know actually. So right. and there's so many bright bright coaches in on every continent. So right. it's that, just, that's one of the biggest things I noticed. Um, and then especially for you now, like being to that point and now going to to go speak. You know, essentially the biggest coaches clinic in the world. How was that? You know, <laughs> that was exciting. Was exciting. Um, yeah, I I I just plan to go. For the FC, and two days later, it seemed like to check the, the uh, registration who, who registered, and um, uh, some organizer I, I don't know the name anymore, but but he approached me and asked me, Hey, uh, we have a, still an open spot for this international session. Uh, would you like to talk about uh, Austrian football? And I told him, Yeah, I, I need to think about that. I'm so nervous about that. And <laughs> what should, should I talk about to, to American coaches in, uh, in the U.S.? But then I, I, I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I, it's a great opportunity to promote the game in Europe and Austria. 
course. And yeah, so it went really well. So yeah, there were like 20, 30 guys in the room. Not like Peter Fleck with 8,000 people in the end, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but <laughs> hey, but you never know. It's those, it's those 20, 30, parts, you know? Yeah. I mean, to, to be honest, better, better that many than like you have like a thousand, then you're sitting there like, oh crap, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I better not say anything wrong. No, it's good. Um, what was it? Um, what, what specific points did you, did you go over? Like when you're talking about football over here, were there like some, some um, points that you talked about? Yeah, um, so on one side, I, I talked about the philosophy of the Dragons, so okay. how, how we're structured, and then about the Austrian football system with the youth program, mm -hmm. that you start really young, um, and that you're not able to, to recruit players, actually. So like in like in German League, the German League almost got like a semi-pro league. Mm -hmm. We were able to bring in the best uh, international talent from, from Europe. And in Australia, the rules are so strict that you have to build on your own players. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went over that. Before that, I there was a British coach uh, talking about uh, the British American football system. Okay. And it was really interesting to compare that and to see how, how other mm -hmm. the, uh, leagues are doing. And that's what I... How, how, okay. how do you think overall, I mean, because you know also about the youth programs in Germany and so forth. I mean, everybody talks about the youth system in Austria, how it's, it's one of the best out here in Europe. Because, like, teams like you guys, I mean, essentially almost every team, is there, is there a rule? Because I don't know much about if there's rules per se, but I know, like, at least Swarko has, from what I know, what is it? Like, it's kind of like a Pop Warner Pee Wee team. Do you guys have that as well? Is this yeah, like, so. Okay. So we started under 11, I think it's a young stage okay. group. And it's tackle, right? It's tackle from, yeah, I think under 11 plays tackle. So that's kind of con controversy in Austria. So okay. we're not really, everybody's not on the same page about uh, tackle football for under 11 kids. Okay. Um, so I think we started um, switching to flag football at that age for, for this year because we thought it's too young. Okay. Um, yeah. But from under 13 on, they're going to play tackle football. And I think that the biggest advantage in Austria is that we can have uh, a fall season and a spring season. And in the spring season, there's, there's the men's team. Okay. And we're going to concentrate on, on athletic training and training in, in, the, in the spring for the youth and have only like two or three qualification games. Okay. And then after the Austrian ball, which is always end of July, every resource scale goes into the youth program. Okay. So a lot of our players are coaches. Okay. and we're going to go on camp in August with the players for one week. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to play their, their season until November and have only a light, light practice next to that for the for men's team. So everybody who is coaching in the youth program is excused of some practices. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a good thing. That's what I, what I like. It's, of course, a way you can do it with a, with a smaller league. You know, and in Germany, we're playing until October. So, and in yeah. the same time as you're also the junior season, for us it's an always, you know, what you want. You want your player as a player or you want your player as a youth coach because of practice at the same time on a different yeah. field on the, in the same city. That was always the thing. I was like, it's not so easy to copy-paste um, the stuff with the Austria, what Austria is doing yeah. because of the way how, how everything is, yeah. is working. Yeah. And... Sadly, it works out for Austria, for me as a German, <laughs> because in the junior national team, I don't know how many years you are unbeaten. There, you're, you're winning in and out every tournament, uh, what is there. That's uh, always very impressive. And you are also a coach on the, the junior national team when I was right. Yeah. 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 How is that um, uh, yeah, set up also for, for you then? And, for, for junior players to be that great? Um, the junior national team is, is an awesome program, which is um, always handed over to somebody who was already in this program. So we have a lot of continuity also on this program. So when I started coaching at the uni, junior national team, it was uh, Jakob Diplinger from the Raiders, who was the head coach. And then always somebody got promoted out of this uh, program. And so I think that was the reason why we could keep the quality on this program so high. 
and yeah. it's always a similar system, similar terminology, and players are really, really proud to be on this team. Yeah, we are always able to bring in the best players, and and the association puts a lot of energy in that too. So having a lot of camps and um, no, it's it's a great thing. That's how, great. How is that set up? Like, cause you're saying there, there's a lot of camps and so forth. I mean, because for the most part, every national team in general, like, like in France, I think you were mentioning it too, in Czech Republic and so forth. Like, everybody tries to get try, tries to get the best setup in terms of camps throughout the year. How is that normally set up out there in Austria? Um, there, it always starts somewhere in in December, November. So in November, the end of the youth season, there it is. It's called um, the Next Generation Ball. There's like an all-star game from every age group, from under 13, 16, 18. And they're gonna play some international um, opponent. And a week after, there's the tryouts then for the under 19 national team. And so there's always, you're gonna start um, seeing the players from under 13 to under 19 who are kind of the top players. And then you go into your uh, tryout to get in maybe the unseen talents. Yeah. And then in December, you're going to have your first camp. It's always like three days where you come in on Friday or the, the night before. Have, and then you're going to have four, four to six practices over a stretch of three days. Um, and it's like really, you're going to grind through those three days. So it's like meeting in the morning, practice in the morning, lunch, meeting, practice, meeting. Um, and that's done two to three times uh, a year. So there is some specific uh, bye weeks during the season, mm -hmm. which are blocked for national team. So mm -hmm. you're gonna know already. Okay, in Easter Easter weekend, you're gonna have a camp for for the junior national team, and then you're gonna meet before them uh, somewhere in June again, and then before the championship, you're gonna meet there again for three days. But since the players already know the term, so that, that a big part of the national team knows already the terminology from the under 18 national team and under 16 national team, there's a lot of carryover too. Okay. So you don't have to teach so much. And um, yeah, and it helps also that there are so many good national, uh, national youth programs like the Vikings, the Raiders, the Giants, right. which produce pretty good players every year. Yeah. That's great. And of course, there was also one guy follow this junior programs who make a lot of noise in the last days, uh, Sandro Blatzkoman. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, amazing story, I think. So, and I think that it's a thing what uh, Austrian football represent pretty well. How is for you as a head coach of an AFL team? Um, you feel there a hype of Austrian, of American football? Because I remember 2014, Germany against Austria in Ernst Habe Stadium, 28, 25,000 spectators. Um, because in Austria, the NFL is way longer on TV than in, in Germany. Um, is there a hype or was just always uh, a, a high level of intention from kids? Um, I think... The NFL didn't change a lot. So I think um, now having Sandra Blatzkoma in the NFL, I think that will increase the, the motivation of the players to work harder because they've seen one of their players did it. Um, I think the, 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 the peak of Austrian football was actually in 2014 because we had 28,000 people in the stadium and never could repeat it in any game. Mm -hmm. I think there was an Austrian Bowl with about 20,000 I don't. I think it was a year after after this championship game, yeah. but we never had attention in the media or something like that. Um, I think there's there's like two two um, two different people in Austria. So there's the Austrian football fan group, and on the other side there's the NFL fans. Mm -hmm. So I I also worked for for ice hockey club last year. And uh, Pulse Fear, which is a um, broadcaster for, for NFL in Austria, they did um, a Super Bowl party in the ice hockey stadium uh, filled with 4,000 people. Okay. Wow. Crazy. It, it was crazy. Oh, nice. it, was, it was really crazy having so many people there. But 
none of them were really Austrian football fans. So they're all dressed in their um, 49ers shirt or uh, Eagles cap. And yeah. um, most of them really don't know that there's Austrian football. So it's really hard to, to pull the people who are American football, NFL fans to get them to to Austrian football. So that's kind of the bridge we need to cross and find out what's the best way to get them also into Austrian football. Yeah. Yeah, this is here in Germany the same, you see, right now, because we have this type and um, you see everywhere guys walking with hats or sweatshirts. Sure. We are yesterday at H&M. Now H&M is selling uh, NFL gear. Yeah. Like, it's really? everywhere. Yeah. It's yeah. really everywhere. But when you when you say then, like, we are here in Ravensburg, we are a really small town. The people, some people know there's the Razorbacks, some people don't. And it's, it's really tough, like you say, to convince these guys to say, hey, uh, American football in Europe is, uh, is big. But what, uh, what we want is um, the kids. We have in Germany, since it's on TV, we have so many kids yeah. coming in and um, asking, oh, I see you play football and I can join practice. So this already happened in Austria for mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah. Okay. So the so Austrian Association started doing like, like a national tryouts. Um, like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, it's called like, like uh, we had two days per year, which were, which were called um, Austrian football tryout, um, powered by the AFBA or something like that. But um, the association put a lot of money into going into schools and uh, bringing the coaches and teams into schools and to um, teach the players some basics of fundamentals and started like a, uh, school flag tournament where schools played against each other. I think that helped a lot mm -hmm. to to yeah. bring in more more kids and they promoted those events really hard on on uh, social media, TV, radio. Um, I think that was the, the, the bigger step for us. Yeah. But we'll see now. So I think Sandra Platzkoma was all over the news in Austria the last couple of days. Um, and I think that will push it. Mm -hmm. That will push it for sure. Um, with, with these with these school projects and so forth, is that something where every team has to do or has to be a part of now in terms of the federation, or is that just like a special thing? Because like, they, so they, yeah. sorry, they 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 can. So you can. The, the the association gives you the contact, okay. and they provide you with uh, footballs and flags for schools, okay. and then you can can use it or don't. And the bigger programs use it, of course, and have to go into. So we we, so I did actually for for one year, uh -huh. um, for one semester. I I got this class of one school, and had um, in their P less uh, P session, we had uh, flag football for once a week, uh -huh. and then at the end of the year we uh, took part in the tournament and yeah. That's great. How how competitive was it? Was it very competitive? We won. But 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 it comes down to what we did actually again because um, every team was coached by some coach or player from another mm -hmm. team, and everything we did was we ran all hitch or all go or hitch and go, and that's everything we did and the other coaches they threw up white cross uh, forwards no. No. make a read and <laughs> maybe super complicated and i told them okay let's just <laughs> um, it, it, what coach frank rose was talking about the other day is like running a yeah. white cross concept let's, let's run some mesh with the kid i actually did that but not in the school project i did it with our little kids i was getting mad yeah. i was like screw we're running mesh uh, but it worked no but anyhow um did you guys, were you guys able to bring in people into your program from the school project? Did you see some turnover, like some kids wanting to get involved and coming in? Yeah, yeah, of course. So that, that helped. So we had a couple of kids come in and the best thing was we were able to go to sports schools and then we brought in really good athletes too. And that was, that was huge for us. Is, is this something you guys are continuing to do now on your own? You guys are looking at it saying like, hey, we want to do this? Because like, I mean, for the most part, everywhere I've been, um, I've been lucky to be a part of developing some sort of school program. I know we're talking about doing that here. 
to bring in like our both knowledge because also Coach Sebastian, you're in charge of doing the youth development in the Czech Republic, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's huge. I mean, I love the fact that in Austria, and I didn't know that, that actually the, the Federation sets that up for teams because the hard part is always, like you said, finding the contacts and so forth. Because um, like over here, like I know with Apple Commons, we set, we set something up. I don't know where it is now. And Poland, I helped set something up. And in, in, in Frankreich, or France, sorry. Um, there's like, we have like a list of like 12 to 15 schools. Literally, it's insane. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what other teams, but for the most part, you see the, the more successful teams, let's say, or let's say that the teams that get a constant turnover of kids, they have some sort of like school program, something, you know. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's pretty big. And back to your, uh, the, the tryout day, I remember it was on the, that's what this was the, the good thing, on the same day everywhere in Austria. Yeah, that, that, is, it. that is the great thing because then everyone really has it on the same day. I think this is something I always can imagine when we do this in Germany, just with all GFL teams, the same day a trial yeah. will be where we blow the social media and all that. Yeah. Uh, all that stuff. That will be, that will be very, very. I think, yeah. I think it's a multiplicator because if only one team promotes one triad, yeah. Nobody is really interested. Yeah. But if you're going to say, like, okay, if the whole league is doing a tryout, then the media is kind of more interested and say, hey, there, there's a big, big event coming up. And they're much more interested into promoting it. Of course. And then people, people around will, will, uh, will see that. Yeah. And yeah, now in the, in the Corona time, you start also to make, um, how call it? Uh, uh, chalk, chalk talks. Chalk talks, yeah. Was it just a normal ID from the boring Corona time or was it something you had in your plan before? Um, we, we planned actually doing like a coaches clinic in, in the future, um, but never had the resource, resources to do it actually it's because it's like, okay, it's a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. um, we need to maybe book a hotel or conference room for that and yeah. uh, always pushed it, pushed it, pushed it to, to not do it, to not to do it. Um, and then it finally this break came on and I, I sat down with my coaches and said like, okay, let's do it now and let's do it online. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe the best time to, to give back. Um, we don't earn anything for, from that. So we say like it's, it's for free and it's like coaches for coaches. And I think, that's what, what I learned to, to love about the game because every coach you're going to contact is going to give you some information. Mm -hmm. So nobody says like, okay, there's my big secret and he says like, okay, I copied it from there and you can copy it from me and I'm going to tell you what, what I'm, I'm doing. And, and that was kind of the start of this conversation. And then yeah. so like, okay, let's do it for two weeks and see who's, who's coming on. And then we had the first coaches approaching us like, Ryan Clements from the Giants, he's like, hey, I, I would like to be part of that and I want to give give back. And and so we had a couple uh, international coaches also talking and also small team coaches. So like we have some Division 2 and uh, 3 coaches from Austria that on, on, on there and they're also really bright and I was happy to give them a platform too. Yeah, that's talk. great. And it's also not everything just in English because we, we are sitting here and watching uh, Frank Rosa's uh, quarterback talk mm -hmm. was in German. I think this helps also a lot to, to break the ice for coaches to maybe say, uh, I don't want to sit down and translate everything. Was this an ID by yourself or how was that coming up with language and, and all that stuff? Yeah, we, we said we want to help first most Austrian, Austrian coaches. Yeah. And we knew that it's probably a problem if everything is in English. Because, um, yes, as an AFL, GFL coach, we are always going to be with English people. English. And we, we have to know English and know how to communicate in this language. But we knew there's, there's four divisions under us who are not in the same situation. And let's give them some um, content uh, in, in German. And, and help them out like that. And yeah, we had 140 people now on the mailing list last week. Yeah, it was a week lot. Kind of, and I mean, that's, that's the thing that I like, to be honest. I mean, especially coming from me, being a guy that's from the States, but you know, like now being over here, having to get acclimated, speak German and so forth. Of course, it's different than 
in, in, in Austria. That's so why, like, when, when I listen to, to um, Austrian Deutsch or German, I need to kind of pay even more attention to what it's normal because then I can figure out what, what they're saying it's just because of the, the dialect, right? But, like, this is something you know, right? At some point, you said you're going to be coaching in German or in Austrian, for example, and you have to know how to explain something. But that's, like, the big thing that I noticed when I was coaching for the, the, the Bayern All-Star, the, the Bayern All-Star State Team, you know, like yeah. – I remember my first year, I had a few kids who didn't speak us, like, they maybe spoke two words in English. And then so it helps, like, fi like finding a way to teach also in German. This is a yeah. thing, like, I think a lot of foreign coaches don't understand that when they come over here. It's like, yes, the, the native language of American football is English. And for the most part, you're going to get stuff where you have to teach it in English or there's certain terms. But you also have to find a way to teach it in German. Because what if you get a player or you're, you got a coach and you got to explain something in their language and you can't? Then we have a problem, you know? And that's, that's actually what I like where you're, you're, you're presenting it now in, let's say, like you said, and so forth. Your focus is in Austrian. And now you have a guy like Frank Rosa, you know? So that's, it helps out the coaches where, like, we know this too at the, at the Bayern Coaches Clinic every year. I mean, you get American coaches that come in and speak English, but you also need a translator and all that. And, you know, and that just yeah. takes time to, to simulate everything. It's huge. Uh, yeah. No, I, think, I think it's a big opportunity to, to, to grow the game. And I think it, it opens up also the, the uh, communication between coaches because I think there is probably one or two coaches who maybe contacted Frank Roser afterwards yeah. to ask him about his system and what he's doing. And before that, people just sat, sat at home and maybe watched some American uh, coaches clinic online maybe. But never were able to contact this person afterwards, and I think it's much more easier if there there's a German speaking coach, yeah. which you can contact and ask and, and see that he's open to help. And he could expand. I mean, that's a big thing. Like with with uh, Frank Rose. I mean, I'm lucky to know him for a while. I coached with him, um, and the big thing we actually talked about when we had him on the show was kind of like how you said, like it's not a secret what we do. You know, it's like at the end of the day, this is the thing, like. We can show you what we run. I can show you my install, you know, so you kind of see how, how I teach things and how I run certain things and so forth, right? And that's kind of the biggest thing that I feel like a lot of coaches in general, they don't want to share that because they think, oh, it's secrets. But this is the thing, right? At the end of the day, for the most part, everybody's running some sort of version of something or like a hybrid. At the end of the day, as a coach, it comes down to how you're calling it. You know, I can show you my install, but my stuff is all half field concept, so you have no idea what I'm tagging. And a tag yeah. So it's like, I could share it to you, but like you said, it's about helping other coaches out and understanding, hey, this is about spreading the game. Because I always look at it, if we better the game overall on every team and so forth, it's going to become more competitive. Instead of, let's say, a specific team dominating every year and saying, oh, we don't want to share our secrets and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, technically it's not secrets. It just comes down to, can we stop your stuff or not? You know? Yeah. You know, that's a big thing. Like, for example, a guy like Lee Rowland, and I know Frankie was also involved with him too, and I've had the pleasure of um, also being a good friend of his. And, I mean, he, he's up front. He says, well, this is the stuff that he does, and so forth. we'll share stuff, you know. And, I mean, he's been a dominant offensive coordinator for a while. You know? Yeah. And that's the big thing that I noticed. Like, guys like you, Sean Fata, Lee Rowland, like, you guys share. You guys want to help out, you know. And then that's the big thing that I look at also, like, if us as coaches – you know, if we want to better the game, we got to help everybody out. You know? Yeah, it, it, it's Absolutely. always tough. I said it's always tough when you kind of meet coaches that are kind of like they don't want to talk about their stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's maybe maybe at the beginning or somebody some some insecurity maybe that you don't, don't want to share. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I never understood it, and yeah, so it makes no sense to to hide anything. Because at the end, it comes down how, how you organize you are and how you structure practice and mm -hmm. how you're going to teach and how the biggest uh, difference between a good team and a bad team is in, in Europe. You can uh, really uh, get your players on the field and, and work hard because we were always okay in, in schemes. So it was in the past, so we, we didn't... Um, create anything new or that it wonder wonder coverage mm -hmm. no but in the last couple of years we built up a vision and our players bought in and that was the difference for us so the player knew 
players knew why they're coming to practice and worked harder than the years before and that attracted more athletes to us too so we actually got some players from from low league teams too uh -huh. who said like they so they they're seeing what we're doing and they want to join us uh -huh. and so like i think that helped a lot what, what, what is the vision that you sold to them and is this like the structure the vision you have throughout the whole program all the way down to the youth um it's it's really a thing for for what we started at the top and our we we just wrote it down at the beginning and uh -huh. um, made it we gonna we called it the green culture and it was like a, a document which put in my beliefs first mm -hmm. and then i got my the other coaches in and we said like okay we want to be a football family uh, working to maximize our potential to compete with the best austrian and european teams possible mm -hmm. and that was what we talked from there on at every kickoff meeting and first coaches meeting and then we shaped that into to our philosophy and players didn't believe that we can can compete with the raiders and vikings four years ago so we were we we lost those games before the game already mm -hmm. and that's what changed the last two years the players started believing that we can challenge the Vikings and, and Raiders mm -hmm. and that we are really, really close to them. And that was kind of a topic last year. So we could we call it hunting season. It's like, okay, now now it's time to 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 be right behind them and 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 challenge those teams to, to play the best game against us. Yeah. And we almost almost got them. Um I mean obviously, and that's how it is. Like you tell me, it's, it's a yearly process, and especially you being involved in that program since basically the humble beginnings, and you trying to find a way to get everybody to buy in. And that's the big I notice. Like if you're upfront with your players, you're honest, and you tell them, "This is what I want to do. These are the expectations." You know, that's always the better way of just being straightforward to get them to buy. In. If they don't want to, and you notice, hey, they don't have probably what it takes to play for you. It is what it is. But at some point. You know, you'll get the guys that you want to have that you that you can coach. You know, they're going to come into the practices if you have two to three times per week. They're going to put in the extra work, prepare because I mean, it's a thing like the AFL in Austria. It's a high level football. You know, just me yeah. being too exposed to it from the very beginning. Like for me, 2014, I saw I was like these players can play, and from very young, yeah. and that's what still to this day when I think about Austrian football, I think back to those moments, kind of seeing like. You have 17-year-old DBs out there, you know, playing like like it's nothing against these veteran receivers. You know, you don't see that. I'm going to say, to be honest, you don't see it out here in Germany for the most part, where you see guys come up immediately and have an impact as a U19 player and now play in the first games and the first league. Like, you don't see it. Like, you see in Austria. Mm. You know, and, and it comes down, like you talked about before, how the federation is involved, how each team is involved in the youth programs and so forth. Because that's my biggest thing. I see – there's a specific and constant turnover team to team, you know, mm -hmm. especially that jump. And everybody knows it from basically that U19, U team, which is compared to high school football, and then into the men, yeah. you know, like teams that I've been at. I mean, let's say Alloy, like we, we would have guys and they were good, but it would take them two years once they were with the men to then get ready, you know. There's a few teams like Schwebisch Hall, for example. I mean, we had Jan Klein, the corner there. He came up as a 19-year-old and he started – that year played against, you know, in the German Bowl and did a damn good job. So it kind of shows you kind of like it's, for the most part, and I would say there's got to be some sort of focus on the youth and like you have there in Danube with the structure and vision and buy-in, you know, it's huge. Sad, sadly, a lot of teams don't, don't think about it that way in you know, <laughs> programs, but you've got to be able to, to build something special and you, you see it, you know, yep. process, right? Yep, yep. So, and I think that is also a really important point for, for the conversion process. It's really to, to be true to your way because I, I was never a big ego guy and I always wanted to have uh, the appreciation spread over the whole coaching staff and mm -hmm. all the people working in this whole organization. And we, we lost a couple of good players over the last years because mm -hmm. they couldn't understand the um, um, this philosophy of being selfless mm -hmm. and I, I never chased those guys to, to stay mm 
Mm -hmm. And I always told them, okay, if they want to go to another club, because they're going to get their more pats on the back or more, more um, individual praise, mm -hmm. then let's do it. Because here it's about team. And we want, want to force that, that if everybody plays good and everybody says, okay, uh, the team win is the most important thing, then we're going to win in the, in the future. Because we're not able to bring in that superstar receiver who who has two thousand yards and twenty eight touchdowns mm -hmm. because we need to spread the talent all over and I think that was really important in the past and that you stay true to that. Uh, definitely I mean like I said, you 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 see you see the process and now like last year was the bigger we kinda of said, like now players understand, hey, we can't compete. You know. Yeah. Um also for you, because was it your your wife? Uh, she's also involved in football, right? Is she also part of the team, or she she only does refereeing or something like that, right? Yeah, she's she's only refereeing. So it's it's a it's a family deal. Um, so my mother is like a team manager for for the AFL team. Mm -hmm. um, my father was uh, the general manager until 2010, 11, so he just said then when I started becoming a coach in the AFL team that he wants to step back and mm -hmm. um, nobody should say I, I got the position because he's the general manager. That's right. why he said like he, he will stop doing the, the management thing. Okay. He will help out if there's anything, but uh, he just don't, didn't want to have this taste yeah. of being it's a family thing that I'm now a coach in the AFL team. Um, yeah, and my wife, she's a referee, and yeah, we yeah. have more discussions about costs and. <laughs> <laughs> does, does she referee for the AFL or? No? Um, no, she. It would have been her first year this year. So. Okay. okay. So do you? Would have been. Do you run by like certain plays with her or trick plays or formation? Say, hey, is this legal or not? Um, I, I try. I try sometimes. <laughs> but just, <laughs> I have a just... question in, in the rule book. Is this allowed? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Because some, hey, so, sometimes you, you can't translate something in the book and you need somebody. So you're lucky you have your wife who's a referee. You could go check with her. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm really thankful for having her because she's already really understanding. Uh -huh. Because um, if you live football, it's it's twenty four seven. So it's like okay, you kind of come home and then you want to draw up that one play or watch some other clips and stay up long. And you're gonna have the players call, and not every wife is so understanding. That's true. That's big for you, especially. I mean, uh, how's her how's her level of football IQ compared to yours? Um. <laughs> yeah, every, every, answer, every answer brings you a problem right now so <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only asking because I, I, I thought it was very interesting for example like I was at Trebish Hall and like Jordan's wife yeah. she would sometimes watch film with him for example or kind of say hey why did you make that call which yeah. is interesting because you know she was here giving him feedback which I think is funny you know? No, we, we're going to have some, some interesting conversations about football mm -hmm. and her football IQ increased uh, with our marriage, actually. Um, <laughs> last week, she was sitting on, on, the, on the couch reading out of a Bobby Petrina book <laughs> and, and, and I, 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 I quizzed her, so what does that mean? And she was, okay, <laughs> that's, that's really hard. <laughs> that's really oh, heavy. I mean, at least, at least right now, especially with the whole situation, the lockdown, at least you got something to keep you busy where you still, you still have the team, the chalk talks, and you help out the wife with, with teaching her some stuff. You yeah. know, maybe one day she can, she can coach a little bit if she wants to. Yeah. You know? Of course. Um, definitely. But anyhow, we, we appreciate having you today. Okay? Yeah, thank you. It was, a, it was really a pleasure to kind of talk to you more about also like more of your, your, your career and your path to get to this program or sorry, to get to this point within the program um, and to get to know what your philosophy and vision is, especially like the buy-in that you try to get the players um, to be a part of. So it was a pleasure to have you. And uh, when, when's the next Chalk Talk? Is it to, to um, it's on Sunday. Sunday is right. Sunday is next yeah, one. Okay. Uh, Lucas Habasak is again talking, our defensive coordinator, about coverage. Okay. okay. So, That's great. Yeah. We'll, we'll look forward to it. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah. Awesome. All Perfect. Right. And have a have Thank a good you. day. God bless, okay?
Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me and keep doing what you're doing. It's a great okay. thing. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. See ya. Bye.